All right, here we are, short story long, and this is a very special episode. I'm very uh, grateful, very thankful to this guest. We've been friends for a while, but um, he's a busy man, and he's a uh, he's an absolute superstar. Kyrie Irving, thanks for coming and doing this, man. Appreciate it, man. This is all love. I appreciate yeah. you having me in your offices. This is dope. It's huge, man. I um, you know I sent you some of the notes, and and this podcast is all about like sort of inspiring young people and and telling the real stories behind people's journeys and stuff like that but i think to get like that perspective from somebody who's made it so big on on this platform and on, you know what i mean is mm -hmm. huge so yeah. i think it'll uh i think people will really enjoy it for sure i don't mind that um let's start at the very beginning that's usually what i do how let's, far all the, the way back to australia right <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's so crazy do you remember australia no you were just born there no, i was just born there and you Melbourne. moved out at two hmm Two is when you moved yep. or no? Two years old. And why was that? Why did you live? My there? dad was playing professionally over there for the Bullying Boomers, and uh, him and my mom got it on over there, and then I was born. Man, <laughs> do you ever go back there? Yeah, I went back about four years ago or three years ago um, to Melbourne, and I stayed there, and I ran a camp, um, connected with the kids in the community, uh, saw a few sites, and then was on my way. Yeah. But it was awesome to be back, though. You don't have any family there, do you? No, but my dad has extended friends out there. Got so it. when we went out there, we were we were taken care of. Got it. Does he go back a lot or no? <clears throat> no, nah, nah, he doesn't either. I mean, from raising me and my sister and then, you know, being over in uh, New York, working on Wall Street, then he didn't have the time. So That's what your dad did? Your yeah, dad worked on Wall Street? Yeah, he was a bonds, ev bonds evaluator on, on Wall Street. And he was that after he played basketball? Yep. Yeah, Jesus my dad Christ. was my dad's pretty pretty nuts. He's like the dopest guy. He is, ever. huh? Yeah. I just saw. I was gonna save it for later, but fuck it. I saw that video of where you redid his house, mm -hmm. and it was so dope. The house and like, episode, yeah, yeah. Like it, it really got me. Like where I was watching, it, I was like, damn, his dad's just really dope. Uh, like he's just like a real. I don't know. He just yeah. seems like a like supportive, but not like crazy. Uh, uh, he doesn't like over Joe Jackson. Yeah, style, no, he doesn't you know over parent. I mean? He yeah. doesn't over parent. My dad always was teaching me how to be an individual and how to reach others and how to connect with others, but also remain humble, as cliche as that sounds, but the humility that most humans, so like, or not most humans, but some people miss sometimes. Yeah. You know, my dad gave it to me at a very young age, which, just, which gave me like a really old soul, which I'm thankful for. Yeah. Was that like as far back as you can remember? That's just how he raised you? Yeah. Yeah, man. Coming up, it was, it was more tough love, but with like huge amounts of support. Um, when I was younger, you know, I went through the phase of, you know, trying to please my dad yeah. and, and do the whole, the great son thing. And then as you start to figure out who you want to be, then you start to take everything that he's taught you, the good that you want to keep and bring on to who you are. Yeah. And then you kind of fill in the rest for yourself. Yeah. yeah. What, um, so you moved from Australia to New Jersey, New York first in the Bronx, New York. Yeah. And then I moved to Newark, New Jersey. And then I went from Newark to West Orange, where my dad currently stays. And West Orange is how far from Newark? About 15 minutes. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's not too far. And why there? That was for work? That was his, his work? No, my dad, well, when we first moved to Newark, New Jersey, um, the the neighborhood that we lived in, it was, a society, it was Society Hill, but we were pretty much next to the hood. So it was, yeah. we were right there, and then my dad moved us to West Orange. Because of that. Yeah, yeah. In, the, in our school district and stuff like that. So my dad definitely had some plans in mind and a set plan that he went to execute. Yeah, smart. It's so crazy how important like those little things are when when you have kids. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. Those uh, little things matter. They do, man. They, and just yeah. think like I what if the smallest thing would have like stopped you from becoming what you are now? You know yeah. what I mean? The smallest move or they're like, "Oh, he'll yeah. be fine. It'll make him tougher." Yeah. You know what I mean? It's well calculated. Yeah. Well, by my dad, man, and that that was passed along to me, it's passed along to my family, so That's it's crazy. well thought out. What about like um so early days in in new jersey what do you remember like early passions or early shit you were into yeah that's that's when i developed my love for skate that was the first I thing I, like when i started i started rollerblading first and then i started skating i, I actually started to take it serious and then i told my dad i got i want to skate for christmas i'm looking on all these freaking skate websites for these trucks and wheels and you know everybody goes through the whole wd-40 Phase where they're spraying it all over the place, and I'm spraying yeah. it in my house. My dad gets pissed, and then uh, I'm setting up like little ramps in the back with just wood wood boards, and I'm just trying to ollie and kickflip over that stuff and start fresh. And then my friend Daniel, who lived like two blocks over, <clears throat> he had like a little mini ramp. Mm -hmm. You know the little. 
plastic black skate ramps that they yeah. like were started releasing at fucking Walmart. They were in or like whatever. CCS magazine. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like yeah. so he had one of those and then it was like a series of events that happened. Him and my cousin got into a fight. My cousin punched him in the face. <laughs> we left. We like we stopped skating and then after that I went home and I continued to skate and then I tried to do an ollie over a rock and then I and my skateboard ended up getting caught. I flew forward. There was another rock on the ground and then I Hit my knee and then my knee opened up. And then after that, my dad broke my skateboard. And he was like, <laughs> you're not skating again. That was, and that was the last time. Was that like stitches? And like, yeah, I got hospital? stitches. I got taken to the hospital. God damn it. How sure. old were you? I was, uh, I was in third grade. Jesus. Third grade. Third grade to about fifth grade. That's when I became in love with skate. And then from that point on, I was Thank like, God for that rock. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, no, imagine, it, if you you were just, imagine if you were working at a skate shop in New Jersey right now because you were just some guy who tried to... That's fine. Grew though. up skating. That's and... fine. Though, bro. <laughs> no. it's, that's my passion, bro. That's it. No, but look at no, all the people you... There, there's, a, there's irony in that rock that's like later on. You just have to remind oh, me okay. of why that rock is so significant in that moment in time and how it brought me to like literally... It came back up probably about a year and a half ago when I fractured my kneecap. That damn rock. Okay, we'll get so so. I'll try to remind you, or if I miss it, just tell yeah, me. Yeah, I got you. Um, so then you're over skateboarding. You're not allowed. It's that's a wrap mm -hmm. at that moment. Yeah, and then then I went into like this Bob the Builder phase, okay. like where I wanted to be architect type, fix everything. Yeah, like so when I would fly out to Seattle, where my grandparents are, they live in Port Orchard, Washington. So I, we would. Fly into Seattle, they would drive up and then drive us back to Port Orchard. Um, my grandfather, um, my mom's dad, he was like the ultimate Mr. Fix It. Like, uh -huh. I want to paint this, I want to build the deck, I want to restructure the whole garage, I want to add a new room to our garage. Like, yeah. and he's full blown, I'm doing this by myself. Yeah. Nobody else except for him, working on it every single day. So I went through that phase after that, for like skate. So, so I was like young I started, as shit. You're young as shit. Like, yeah, like I'm a like, drill, the, like running drill, around the house. Like, yeah, check what this I out. did was my dad didn't break every skateboard I had, uh -huh. but he broke the one that <laughs> that I that mattered. Yeah, yeah. I uh, drilled. Uh, I took a sled and then I drilled a skateboard at the bottom of it, and then I started like I st I put like a a steering device on it, like so I could so you're, like, wobble down the hill. Down the, so yeah, down so, the, yeah. yeah. And I'm like, that was your first big invention. That was my first big invention. Did you think maybe that you were gonna like sell that invention Hell to Walmart no. and like Hell become no. a billionaire? Hell no. It was a, it was, <laughs> it was a shitty built up sled skateboard. <laughs> That's all it was. So how long did that phase last? Like a year. I'm was, still Mister Fix It though. Really? But I'm still Mister. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like you're at your yeah. No, house you tell in me you, Like yo, yeah, I got this. Yeah, I got this. I got this. Like no, man. It's no, a, no, we can hire. They can attest to it. Now. My friends can attest to it. I'm Mister Fix It. Oh man, TV's broken. All right. Check this. Just give out. me one second. <laughs> Let me get my yeah. trusty drill. <laughs> um, did you, was there ever any like trouble, any close friends uh, getting in trouble or any of that shit, gang shit going on, anything like that? In, in, when, when I was younger? Yeah. Nah. That's good. Nah. nah so that none move of that, was none enough of that, to... None of that to like, none of that to where it was out in the open. It was definitely there, but you know. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. What, um... So then what, man? So then Bob the Builder, Tom and the then builder. and then how did did you sort of just grow out of that? A little yeah, bit? yeah. And, and then I started uh, like really, really taking basketball serious after like seventh, eighth grade. That's when I really started taking basketball extremely serious. And how did basketball like? What was the first moment that basketball entered your life? Do you remember that? The first moment? Yeah, like I like, mean, I've been around it. I've been around your it. Dad. Yeah, my dad, yeah. like you know, I, everyone always says it, but he did put the ball in the crib and. You know, and just develop uh, my skills, but the love that came from within, because you know all the kids would be running around in the park, and my dad would be driving to his games, and I'd be like probably the only kid, and like their basketball hoops, their fountains, you know, like they're they're taking it, like they're every all the kids are going crazy in this park, yeah, and I'm just sitting there on the sideline, like sitting on my ball watching my dad play, like just not feeling it, nope. yeah, no, like no, I wasn't feeling anything. They were, I was. This was what I was here for. That was to watch basketball. My oh, dad was so good too. Got it. What? What? And was that? What age was that at? That was. I was always around the game. Like my yeah. dad always. So you. My always... dad would push me in the stroller in the gym yeah. with my little sister, and then he would put us in the like at the end of the bench, yeah. and then he would. He would. So go you play. never like rebelled or like you know what, dad? Fuck basketball. No, I had a point. You did when that happened. 
What age? Was that skateboard age? No. That was sophomore year of high school. Jesus Christ. I was gonna... So had you already been playing like organized yeah. basketball? Yeah. And did you drop out for a year? No, nah, no. Nah, I, you I took worried. all my trophies that I had and I put them in a bin and then I tried to like, I tried to smash all of them. All my trophies that I had, I tried. I put it, took a cardboard bin, big cardboard bin. I took all my trophies and I started throwing it and I started sp uh, trashing all of them. Was it sparked by something? No, because me and my dad had a. <laughs> I was getting. I was in the midst of uh, changing schools, so my dad, um, you know, he was just really like, "You got to make a decision. You have to make a decision." I'm like, "Dad, like, I'm gonna make the decision when I'm ready. Mm -hmm. but you got to make the decision." And he, and the pressure from him. It was, he was like, you're not taking this serious enough. And yeah. I'm like, dad, it's just basketball. He's like, what are you talking about? You want this to be your life and you want to do this? And I'm like, dad, you don't really love it. And I was like, maybe I just don't. Maybe I just don't love it enough. Maybe I just don't love it enough as, as much as you, dad. Yeah. And I was like, I quit. You're like, check this Because I'm quitting basketball. And then, Gosh. and then <laughs> you're going to get a laugh out of this jokes. My dad got so mad at me and my stepmom too, that they wanted to train me to the worst school in Newark just to, like, you're going to trans, like, we're. We're transferring you. And by the way, I don't mean to say that's the worst school in New York, but at the time, that was for like delinquent. It was yeah. for like but he was all the kids that went there. Threatening to transfer you to prove a point? Yeah, because <laughs> I didn't want to play basketball. Oh, you want yeah. to go to normal school? Yeah. Oh, you want, okay. Well, here you go. Okay, you want to play basketball? All right, we're transferring you. I was like, why, why am I getting punished because I don't want to play basketball anymore? Yeah. So after that, about a week passed by, my dad left the trophy. I took, uh, my dad took the trophies that I smashed. And um, as I'm walking down the stairs, he tries to take them away from me. Uh -huh. And I'm telling him like that, I don't I don't want these damn trophies anymore. Yeah. And basically in the back of my mind, I couldn't say it to him, but I was like, F these trophies. Yeah. So I took it out to the curb and I was about to throw them all out. And did he go get them? Nope. Where he they was like, oh, you want, you want to take them out? Okay, you want to be all tough? Uh -huh. like, all right, all like, right. I don't care about these trophies. Where are they now? They're they're in the house. They're in that house. They're in the house. house. Yeah. They're, but all of but them didn't smash, them? my dad. But they were smashed? Yeah. Are my they dad like... saved it. I brought it back in like after about two days because yeah. the garbage truck wasn't taking the trophy. Thank God. <laughs> they didn't take the trophy. <laughs> yeah. So, um, Did they have to be like repaired? Mm -mm. Mm -mm. The ones that were smashed, I didn't really want anyway. Yeah. Those weren't like the MVPs or like the championship trophies. So those were just like garbage. Like you got it. So then what happened? You just sort of got, you, did you just, did that just blow over a little bit? No, I uh, ended up transferring. I made a decision. I told my dad. You know, I want to do this for my sake and for my future. And then I went from uh, my freshman and sophomore year, I went to Montclair Kimberly Academy. And yeah. then at the end of my sophomore year, at the end of the season, I transferred to St. Pat's. And that's how I met my best friend now. And when did you, did you know, like, right away that you were better than the other kids at no. basketball? Mm -mm. Like no. in high school where you just wanted the guys? Mm, I was, I'm... I was I've never been just one of the guys. I've always kind of uh you know strut you know to my own like chord. Uh, yeah. All at at all times no matter what. But after I went from Montclair Kimberly to St. Patrick's, I went from seeing, you know, these kids they're driving. This is when Hummers was like ridiculous. Oh, yeah. I the, we got the senator's <laughs> son going to the school. You know, kids are this 25 grand a year yeah. to go there to Montclair Kimberly. So I'm there Tie every day, khaki, shoe game, impeccable as always. Yeah, but yeah. then, uh, you know, it was just a culture shock. Yeah. I went from being in Montclair, New Jersey, to being in Elizabeth, New Jersey, at St. Pat's, in the middle of the hood. The middle of the hood. <laughs> and, you know, when my dad first pulled up to the to the uh, school, he was like, Kai, I'm picking you up every day. He was looking out the window. He was like, I'm picking you up every day. I ended up taking the bus after school, two and a half hour bus ride from Elizabeth to West Orange, New Jersey. Jesus. All to be at a better basketball school and like for a better opportunity. Yeah. It was all worth it. And then I ended up it all it opened my eyes to a deeper culture and deeper appreciation for basketball because when I was at Montclair Kimberly, I was getting thirty, you know, almost thirty eight and eight and I'm you know, but we're not we're losing. Yeah. I'm like I'm getting not I'm not getting the recognition I felt like I deserved. And then um, I made a decision, which was one of the best decisions of my life. Because when I went there, it was just eye opening. Yeah. It was just eye opening. You know, all the kids there have a a goal, and you know, we, they all came from almost underprivileged backgrounds, but collectively, we all made up like this very intimate family yeah. at St. Patrick's from the team perspective and as well as the student body. Yeah. So. 
Do you think that like that, like you think you still could have made it as far as you have without making that strategic move a, a, no. when you were young? No, I, I. You just have to be around. Is, is it? Is it just? It's just being around more skilled. Yeah, athletes you have, in a you have better to, program, right? Yeah, but also from an individual perspective, you have to be able to, you have to be willing to take that leap, and yeah. that leap of like jumping into the unknown of things that can almost happen unexpectedly that you feel like you're prepared for, but you're never really prepared for it. Yeah, as a kid, I always had to make those decisions. So, you know, my dad laid out the foundation and the plan, but the decision making was all up to me, yeah. which has been the best thing for me because now that you know i'm always self-evolving and as i've gotten older the decisions to make to do what's best for me and ultimately for my family and people that are around me i'm comfortable with that mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. i i've i've seen like so much shit so yeah. I've, I've made decisions that would have changed that would have been very different if, if i made the other yeah, decision yeah so it's just pretty crazy at that age to like have that drive and make those decisions because i think a lot of kids even a lot of talented kids are like Ah, fuck it. Do I really want to ride a bus for two hours? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, right, I love but basketball, it, but like... It's it's all worth it. It's yeah. all worth it. Every experience and every moment is all worth it. It's just something anew. It's something that you can't necessarily prepare for. I I, I get, you know, it's scary but exciting, and then yeah. it's warm, yeah. and it's, so, <laughs> yeah. it's just like it gives you, no, gives you goosebumps when you have to make a big decision. I know. And then you have that inner you know that thing that inner inner voice like that's just telling you that you make the decision already and everything's gonna be okay have you ever ignored that voice and then realized of, you were of wrong of course of course I, I ignored it for probably 24 years of my life i'm 25 now so that was that was a drastic uh step that i took in my development as a as a man and as a human being yeah because that you know that fear of listening to that to say your intuition and that inner voice yeah. is, is always going to be there because you don't want to be wrong, but that voice is usually right. If the vibe and the energy that you're feeling, that your body's feeling, is telling you to make this decision, I'm pretty sure it's the best decision yeah. for you. You feel it. It's just you tough. know it. I know. You know it. It's fucking tough though. Why? I don't know why. I can't think of like one in my life that I have done that I regret. Because Here, no. here's the two questions, right? Yeah. The one is, have you ever d followed that decision and really regretted it? Mm -hmm. And have you ever not followed it and then seen like, damn it, I blew it. Yeah. And and wish that something, yeah. you know what I mean? But I don't think that I've ever regretted it. It's just, I don't know why the human brain works that way. Why aren't you just excited about good opportunities? Like, why does your body fight it? You well, know what I, mean? I mean, it's usually the, the passion and drive for wanting more. Because honestly, when you get something, it's like the, the value of you working towards that opportunity like that value right there goes away as soon as you get it and then yeah. when you don't have it anymore then it's like you miss it so yeah. that in between like you have to enjoy all those steps and moments no matter what whether good or bad because life fucking sucks man <laughs> it's like just it's just so crazy it's just so up and down and shifty and yeah you know but it's so beautiful at the same time because it just it brings you to places that I, I can't even imagine the shit that that has transpired and things that I've come into and yeah. figured uh, figured out and yeah. that I'm able to impact. It's just ridiculous, man. That's all because of life. So it has its peaks and valleys, man. You know what I mean? Peaks and valleys for sure. Um, never consistent. <laughs> never consistent. No, never. There's no way to like. <laughs> it's figure consistently it out. inconsistent. I like, feel like, like part of like when I started this podcast, I'm like, you know what? I'm gonna figure it out. Like yeah. I'm gonna figure out the key to success, the key to happiness. Like you just can't. There, it isn't one. Even the hardest working, most successful people, whatever, richest people in the world, like go through the same struggle. For sure, it happens every day. Yeah, there's no way around it. it. Happens every day. I think that, you know, sometimes you know human beings forget that they're human. Like that. That's what makes us. Yeah. That's what makes this world go. It makes us human. Like people feel things. People think things. People struggle with things. People overcome things. Yeah. And it's just, you know, how do we connect? How do we bridge that gap? And that's me. I yeah. bridge that gap. Yeah. 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 Um, so was it at high school, last couple of years of high school, where you really started to like shine and, and get a lot of attention or no? When I first transferred in, um, you know, like I said, it was just an eye opener. Um, but I went there. You know, taking the bus, going to school, and then I started working out with the team, but I wasn't coming to the open gyms because my AAU coach was a friend of Coach Shavanis, Chris Shavanis, who is now the 
coach there at it's called the Patrick School now. Got it. Um, and still it's in Union, New Jersey. But there is a uh yeah. I met Coach Savannah, so you, you're making me I fucking lost my <laughs> What? You no, know, you said high school. Okay, no, like when no, did no, you but, start like you know what I'm saying? Like what I'm yeah, trying no, to wrap oh, my when head I first, around, yeah, yeah. Is like when did like so you obviously chased the opportunity of going to the better school. Mm-hmm. And when did it start to like separate where it's like, okay, Kyrie is really yeah. like there's in the summertime here. when I transferred, that was probably the that was that got the ball rolling. That's when I became ranked. I was in the top fifty. Yeah. And then right when I transferred to St. Pat's, they put me right in the top hundred kids in the nation. And then I went from like eighty two to like forty something and then I went to like twenty two and then I was like 14, then I went to eight, and then I went to four, yeah. and then I was in the top three. And that's St. Pat's elevated that status because we were playing on, we were playing a national schedule. We were playing against Oak Hill, we were playing against, you know, all these great high schools. And then on top of that, we still had to play against Jersey teams. So my senior, I lost, when I tried to St. Pat's, I ended up losing six games in mm-hmm. two years. Mm-hmm. I think we lost three my junior year, and then we lost three my senior year. But my senior year, we lost three games by a total of three points. Jesus Christ! Yeah. So we were, and then we didn't even play in the state tournament. Some Why? like, this is one of the craziest stories ever. But is it the Rock? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. No. The they had a they had a, a who was he coming to fix? He was coming to fix the the like he was coming to fix the ra- the radiator. He said he was coming to fix the radiator and coming to fix the at the hair and stuff like that. No, in the gym, this guy. Oh. They hired a private investigator to come to our gym, and there's vi- they videotaped us practicing with our head coach. Like our head coach isn't allowed to be there at our practices, but every school does it. Uh. But they hired a private investigator to come in. He had the camera in his bag. Literally, I went. This is what I go. This is what I went through in my life. Wow. I had a private investigator at my high school basketball practice because other teams did not. They other. Basically, I feel like it was a collective, so we couldn't participate in the state tournament. Damn, they got you, and you yeah. were the only one that got caught on anything like that. No, Your no, team? like the team, the whole team. No, not you. I mean the team. No other teams got like busted no, for something. No, but all the other teams do it. You. Yeah, we were, we were, and what's funny about it is that they caught us at a time where we had half of the court. Like we were practicing half of the court. There was a play going on that I, that I was in mm-hmm. High School Musical, mm-hmm. my senior year. So we had half of the court, and we're practicing, and this private investigator catches us, and the judge rules that we were out of state tournament. What a joke. Were you devastated at the time? Yeah, I was. I was. I remember coming to practice and finding out, and we had one of our assistants uh, there, and assistant coaches, and it was Grant Billmeyer. And I distinctively remember, <laughs> it was so funny, man. We were, we were running, and I said, man... I looked at him. I said, man, fuck these suicides. Man, I'm not <laughs> doing any more suicides. Yeah. We're not in the state tournament anymore. What am I even here for? Yeah. And then Grant, he, he says it. Like, he has this deep, deep voice. He's like, hey, Curry, that's exactly why Brandon Knight is better than you. I swear to you, I almost charged him. And, like, my, and I'm, I said, I'm definitely not running now. I started going to the back, getting all my clothes. All my teammates chasing, Kyrie, don't leave, don't leave. I'm like, nah, man, he's wilding, he's wilding. Because my junior year, um, when I was at NBA PA camp, me and B Knight matched up against one another, and he got the better of me at NBA camp. And he was just a lot stronger, a lot bigger. So from that point on, me and him were always competing for the one and two spot of who are the top two point guards in the nation. So oh, it would flip back and forth. Yep. So Damn, that was why already would he say that to you. He That's knew the it was worst thing you could off. possibly say. He knew it was gonna piss me off. Was but he we... trying to teach you like an attitude lesson? Oh, no, fuck his lesson. That's <laughs> <laughs> his lesson, man. Whatever so what did lesson he, walk he out? was trying to teach. You walked out that day? No, I finished practice. And then after that, I just I just tried to dunk on everybody that was at the room. <laughs> that was it. That was when I was really getting up back in high school. Yep. Yeah. Were you like uh like at, at that moment, did you start to feel like you were sort of destined for the nba or like what was your attitude then like you know what i'm saying after like, my senior year i guess yeah or like into like, my senior what i'm trying year? to wrap my head around is like if you're in high school and you're top one and two and you're doing all this shit and you're and you're everyone knows who you are mm-hmm. at that moment do you feel like okay i'm definitely going to the nba it's just about how i can perform there or is it just more sort of like well i don't know what's college gonna look like uh it started to get more serious when um uh, because we, we, my dad, is, he's a universal guy, so he has a few connections here and there. And and as I was getting older, I knew that there were people 
helping him and guiding him along the way in terms of shaping my my career mm-hmm. and what was happening and allowing me to to know certain things that I need to go to to know going forward, especially in the game of basketball. So after my senior year, um, I started going to the McDonald's All American Game, the mm-hmm. Jordan Brand Classic, and then the Hoop Summit, which was in Portland, which we played against the uh, best world team. And uh, you know, at that time, that's when scouts started to have pre uh, NBA draft uh, mocks. Yep. mock mock NBA draft. So then I started to see my name in the top 10 yeah and this was before i even played a game in college yeah so yep. so you knew like if i stay focused this is i knew i knew that there was more work to do yeah i knew that i've I've always known that like were you was... always humble did you go through like a phase where you're like man fuck everybody i'm Kyrie. <laughs> no uh-uh. <laughs> never? Uh-uh. Never. Man, never never i would. i mean there's always a time where you're like feeling yourself where you think that yeah you know the shit and you carry that around and people are looking at you like bro you're just as normal as i am <laughs> yeah <laughs> like, yeah you're a human being, bro. You you just have an unbelievable skill that you hone every single day. Yeah, I would have been like, then that's why I'm not a normal human being. Yeah. So fuck you, <laughs> normal dude. It's funny because I've done like I've done sixty of these podcasts now, and a lot of times the stories start with people having a love for basketball, and in a few of them, the story they get really cocky about basketball in like high school, and then the story always goes to, and then when did you realize you were going to have to have a normal job, right? Yeah. But your story doesn't go that way. It's the first one where it's been like, no, you actually it worked. Yeah, no, it, I knew that there, I I know that there's, this just now, I, just right now, I know that there's still more work to do. Yeah. For sure. Yeah, yeah. That's, but you that's, gotta that, have yeah. that. I mean, oh, that's the only way to survive, I feel like. And, mm-hmm. um, okay, so constant then. Constant search, constant search. When did uh, the decision to go to Duke, you went from there to Duke? Mm-hmm. And how does, how does that work? And that's where I met my other best friend, Josh, over here. That's and, dope. You have a group then, of real friends, huh? Yeah, bro. We met at different points in our lives. <laughs> and then when I went to Duke, Crazy eighteen year old kid just experiencing college campus, you know, just yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. being the number one team in the country, having cameras, you know, following us around at practice and you know, everyone's saying that we're gonna repeat as national champions because the year before they had just beat Butler. Got it. So, you know, everybody's really hyped. We're number one team in the country. We have about four potential NBA players that are on the mock draft, mm-hmm. which was myself. Mason Plumley, Kyle Singler, and Nolan, we had a, a main four and then went through preseason. Eight uh eight games in, we play against uh we play against Michigan State. And I talked to Josh about it before the game. I said, Bro, I promise you, I am going to destroy this game. Mm-hmm. I am gonna prove to this man on the other end. And the other point guard happened to be Kalen Lucas from Michigan State. Yep. And they were saying that he was the number one point guard in the country. And also he said that, you know, he was saying I was inexperienced as a freshman and talking all this. I'm like, okay, look, I play against grown men for a living. My yeah. dad brought me a LeBron. I've, I've, I'm baby food. Yeah. He's baby yeah. food. So yeah. from that point on, nothing against Ken Lucas, but it was just from the competitive yeah, standpoint. You got to, yeah. And then I went out and had 31. 31 and 8 or 31 and something. That has to just feel so, yeah. like, incredible. And then after that, I'm yelling at Josh. I think, I'm I'm like, I fucking told you. Yeah. I fucking told you. I told you I was going to destroy this game. God I told you that. Us and normal people don't get that feeling. <laughs> oh, no, you, know you got to like, fired up. I can't leave the office today and be like, I fucking told you that podcast was going to be on point. <laughs> like, we don't get to have you gotta, But you got to do that sometimes. You got to fire the troops yeah, up. Yeah, maybe I'll do that on the way out. Guys, fire the troops up. Get ready. On the way out of here, we're- <laughs> you got to fire them up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, Can I ask you one thing going back? When did you, because there's obviously a decision to go to Duke instead of go right into the draft, right? Yeah, no, well, I had to go. I had to, you have to be removed from Got high it. school for a year. Got it. Yep. 19. And did you only go to Duke for one year? Yep. yep. Got it. I played 11 games. That was it. Yep. I got hurt my eighth game. My eighth game wasn't Michigan State. My eighth game was against Butler. I think my fourth, sixth game, whatever, but I got hurt. Got it. In Continental Airlines Arena, in New Jersey, in my hometown. Like hurt, hurt. Yeah. Like I was out for three months. And then I sat. And that part is something that really made me fall in love with Duke even more. Why? When I got hurt. What happened? Because I was, I was no longer, at, I was no longer as connected to the team because I couldn't. It yeah. wasn't like I was running around with them or anything. I was in the training room and then I would meet up with my teammates and then I would be crutching around yeah. and keep trying to keep up with everybody. And my toe is my toe is pointed down in this cast and I got my little sock on it. And I'm just mobbing, yeah, mobbing, just constantly mobbing. And then 
I got to see and experience the culture of Duke. Yeah, and yeah, got yeah. to, you know, randomly be like just walking around and you know me, I'm just friendly with everyone. So I'm just like, <laughs> oh no, bro, hey, you wanna you wanna drink? I'm like, but it's seven PM. Well, I don't have practice tomorrow. Come yeah, on, let's go. Oh, yeah. you just you know, you just keep being a kid. And then I got to see a few plays. I got to see um them uh practice their plays. We took an acting class. Yeah. Then um you know, I just started going places by myself because I knew that they had to get rest for the game. So yeah. I'm like, man, I'm I'm going out on a Wednesday night. Yeah. That you know, they they play Friday. I'm going out on a Wednesday night randomly because I have nothing else to yeah. do. Have you always been that type of guy? Yeah. You're like just a really dip. outgoing, like friends dip with off. sort of anyone. You gotta dude. yeah, you gotta just dip off and experience it, man. Yeah. Yeah. Like you gotta meet you gotta meet you gotta meet the world, man. Yeah. You gotta meet them. You gotta meet them with open arms, with a whole bunch of love, man. Just nothing but That's respect. Crazy. I wish you the best. Nothing but the best intentions for you. Yeah. And then we keep it pushing. That's it. Damn it. That's, That's a really good personality trait. That's how you write. I'm not too good at that. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I'm kind of a. I'm kind of a. <laughs> no, but it's cool. To, also, cool. Also, dick. no, no, you <laughs> no, But the thing about it, even if you consider yourself antisocial, you're still not even close to antisocial. Yeah. Because the people that you're close around, they know you for the real you. So, why not make that those relationships stronger? Yeah, show them true. how you appreciate them. Then just I'm hang just out not with good them at a lot. And just mob out. Yeah, like I'm good with a small group of people. Yeah, yeah. that's fine. That's normal. Okay, that's good. normal. So this was all actually just a therapy session for me. Thank oh, you. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> um, what, uh, so did you know when you went to Duke that you were going to do one year and then go to the draft? Or were you not I thought sure? I was going to do two years. I wanted to do two years. And what changed? <laughs> it was probably April. And I'm telling all my guys, I'm like, man, I think I'm coming back. I'm thinking about coming back. I'm thinking mm -hmm. about coming back. And at this point, I was projected to be the number one pick or top two. So... My dad was like, no, nah, you're not, you gotta, you can't be, it's not fair. You're around your teammates. You're seeing them every day. You, you're, you're missing it. You're, you got that feeling that you're missing out. And, you know, your teammates are getting geared back up. They're starting to work out again. And I'm in there. I'm like, damn, man. Like, I'm just, I'm alone. I, I'm seven in the morning. I'm in there working out with CeCe by myself. And, and I'm watching these guys. They get, I know I didn't even have the Duke gear on anymore. Like my locker was being, it was like my name was dang there off the locker already <laughs> because I think that uh, you know my dad kind of figured that how I would feel. I was so close with the guys. I wanted to stay. I love the environment. I love Duke. Yeah. I want to stay on campus. My dad got me a flight on a Friday. He was like, "Come home." He was like, "Come home for the weekend. Then we'll make our decision." I went home, <laughs> and then I was home, and I got to. Gather my thoughts yeah. and then think about taking that next step. I called my boys. I was like, guys, I'm I'm going to the draft. And, you know, they, they kind of knew as well. So then from that point on, I was just like, started working out for the NBA draft. And you knew before you even decided to go or not that you were projected top one or two? Yeah. Damn it. Because if that happens, I mean, shit, you got to just do it. Yeah. You know, if you're yeah. like projected one or two, that's it's like, ah, fuck yeah. it. You know and my mean? dad was like, you're not going to, you're not going to, you're not going to get any better playing in college for one more year. Yeah. You know, like you, like you have nothing else to prove. I was just like, dad, but I played 11 games. Like I want to have yeah. a legit college experience and I, and I love Duke dad. I love it. Yeah, you just got uh, to know yeah, everyone. Yeah. That's, that's what I'm saying. So I'm like, popping. <laughs> <laughs> like fuck. so all of that, all of that. Damn man. it. Um. Can you run me through like draft day? Yeah. Like, like, do you go to the? Uh, <laughs> these are all the things I'm really Shaking jealous his head of. Like, Shaking his head, why? Because it was because nervous? of how gnarly it was. Was like, it like it just, hey, like uh, stressful? Nah, it was just a whole bunch of anxiety and you know a feeling in here of just nervousness. But my dad and Jeff had an idea of where I, you know what was gonna happen. Did you go to the? Do you go to the draft? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you like you get an invitation to the draft. Usually, like the top twenty draft picks, and they have a whole bunch of tables with their families. Um, the players take a bus from New York City, and then we went to the uh, Eyes Out Center, um, which is in downtown Newark, uh -huh. like right in the middle. And the draft was happening, huh? Prudential, excuse me, Prudential Center. What year was that? Is that not the Eyes Out Center? Old Nets. Oh, Old Nets. Yeah, yeah. Two thousand eleven. Yeah, two thousand eleven. 2011 and <laughs> um what so like you go you with your boys your family I'm with, suited up I'm with my best friend Kevin yeah I'm with my best friend Elijah 
with my dad, my sister, and my agent. And just nervous fucking energy, yeah. right? Like, what can you even compare that to? I don't know, nothing. I was just, right? It's not like I was overwhelmed with just anxiety like, because I had imagined all of this happening, but I didn't know exactly what it was looking like. And it was just so many bright lights, cameras, and all that stuff, and media, and, um, you know, God then I was it. just waiting. Like, I was sitting there, had my hands crossed. With the first pick in the 2011 NBA draft, Cleveland Cavaliers select Kyrie Irving. God damn and I was like, oh, I'm shaking David Stern's hand, get the hat. And I look up and all I hear is, you go, boy. You better go, boy. I hear, ah, I was hear was yells. My, all my family and friends were there because it was in Jersey. Oh, so when yeah. I got pick number one, it was like my whole, we had them, we were all like, everybody was scattered, but just a, a just, oh, go, go. All I was thinking about from that point, I gotta get it. To, I gotta get to my draft party. <laughs> I got like the me. moment you walk off stage. Like, like the moment right. I walk off stage, I'm like, <laughs> I got drafted. I'm about to be the first one out of here. <laughs> I got yeah. drafted first. I'm like, I'm gonna be the first one out here, guys. I'm gonna be ready in 40 minutes. Yeah, literally like an hour and a half past. I'm doing media. I'm like one of the last people to leave. I'm trying <laughs> yeah. to get all my family together. So I'm like, I'm getting, and at this point, I'm getting very impatient because now the night is starting to get. It's starting to get later and later. And I'm like, man, am I going to make this? I'm getting so many calls and texts at the same time because we had a, a draft party for me at a club that was called 466 yep. in West Orange in my hometown. Yep. Everybody found out about it. But it was also open bar. And they had about three, bar, three bars in there, two bars, two bars, upstairs and downstairs. But there was a big dance floor. And where we're from, like how we have parties, there's tables and stuff, but everyone is like in a dancing yeah, like in the middle like, having dance fun. like yeah. like we have a we have club music in jersey which people just go crazy to and, and it's just like unbelievable house type shit or no it's like you you listen to drake to the max yeah when it goes like the beat and it's like yeah 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 yeah, yeah it's basically like yeah. house but it's like, like fun shit yeah it just yeah. adds that bottom baseline that's just it just mimics like jersey club and, yeah. and we all dance to it and we have dances to it so you know, that was a hell of a party, though. I mean, I bet. Hell of a... It's fucking dream come true. I went in and put on my red, red little button-up short sleeve with some khakis and some boat shoes. And then I had... <laughs> he remembers. <He's laughs> and I had like, on yeah. my hat. Yes, you did. And I had on my hat. And I'm walking around, and all I'm seeing around me is just all, like, all my previous classmates from MKA, from elementary school, from... Man. Middle school, from Duke, from now, like, I'm just seeing a whole just collective of people that I genuinely know at my draft party. And then on top of that, no disrespect to 4C6, I hope they don't lose their liquor license over this, but <laughs> when I got drafted, I was 19. Yeah. So if we do the math, most of my friends yep. were underage. Mm -hmm. And my dad, the way they did it was they gave these wristbands out for open bar. Yeah. So my dad goes up to all my friends that like all like my close friends and he gives them the bracelets and he gives them a few bracelets to give out. So you have underage kids and then you have an open bar. Yeah. And oh, man. and you give the people a wristband. So yeah. now it's like You can give 40 year olds an open bar and it's a mess. Oh, oh but you <laughs> give some 19 and 20 year olds in a club that's and you give them an open bar, oh, it got crazy in there. It got crazy. God damn it. That had to be like top five nights of your life, no? Yeah, for sure. Just just because of the moment that we were celebrating and the amount of people and support that was saying. there. Bro, once again, like the amount that I would give to be able to just have one party because I was just picked number one in the draft <laughs> in my hometown. Like, are you shitting me? Because yeah, even if it would have been like out in LA or something, right? You're kind of screwed. Like, yeah, you have yeah. like your five boys. And yeah. Like, I don't know, you want to go to Hyde? Yeah. Right? <laughs> but like, at your hometown yeah. with all your fucking teenage friends getting yep. shit faced? Yep. God damn it. Yep. And um, we left. We left and we. Oh, you remember? We left and we had a rap. <laughs> no, no, not that was, that was the next year. That was rookie of the year. Uh, that was rookie of the year, yeah. Yeah, draft party went to my house. Got so you went? Yeah. And I woke up at six to hop on a private flight with uh, MGK and Dan. Gilbert. Oh no, Dan Gilbert didn't fly, but MGK flew with the plane. That's how I first met MGK. That's why I, on the Gilbert. Yeah, plane. like it was just that he was one of the first people that I met. Like this is when MGK was like first, first, first coming out. Yeah, Lace I remember up, that. Like just was EST was just in. 
Cleveland, Ohio area. And yep. even, I was like, MGK, MGK, Machine Gun Kelly, Machine Gun Kelly. Yeah, we and were working with him a lot him. then. Yeah. And I remember seeing him on the jet, I think, with you. And I was like, damn, yeah, MGK. He was there. Made like, it. he was there when I first you know, first came into Cleveland. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And you guys are homies, right? Yeah. He's totally. a cool guy. Um, Jesus Christ. Okay. So, <laughs> man, I, so I, I felt excited. Party, yeah, like, yeah. I just felt like I just won something. 6 a.m. flew to Cleveland. That's how it works. Out, yeah. You go the next day. Yeah, six a.m. I was out of there. And you guys, hit, you're like, hey. All it's I remember, me. I remember closing my eyes like this, and I was there. It was a blink. It was. I literally closed my. Are you like I was over, so like, tired. Up, I know. I was. I was hungover, tired. Yeah. Celebrating the night before. It was, but I was in there like, oh, we're here. I had my suit on. I got off the plane. Then we had media stuff to do, and then uniforms and take pictures. And I had number fifteen. I was like, oh my goodness. This <laughs> yeah. is the garbage number just yeah. for me yeah like number 15 as a point guard yeah why Did they just assign that to you yeah they were because I, I couldn't wear 11 because of Junis Ogalskis mm. so we had we were they were going to retire Z's number which yep. they end up retiring three years later so got it man how yeah. dope you go the next day and you're like hey guys it's me the yep. number one pick you know yeah. but also you know. it came with a lot on the backside that really took a uh, roller coaster for my life, which was coming in after Braun had just went to Miami. So, so now, that's when that's what I was unclear on. Was it the year after he left that you came in? Uh, or two years? No, maybe? no. He they played the Mavericks in 2010 in the finals. I came the next year. So when he decided to leave, he played out that season. Yeah, that's when the Cavs or Cavs lost 28 straight games. Yeah, and then I came in the next year. So they Jesus. were like, "Oh, are you gonna fill the shoes? And how are you gonna, how are you gonna make us better?" And that had and to be crazy. Stuff. Yeah, no, that was... feeling. Do you think that that feeling mixed with being a number one draft pick is like an insane amount of pressure, or does it oh, not yeah. really get to you that? Well, way? for sure, because now you're 19 years old. Jesus now, Christ. now, now, I'm gonna bring you in terms of the transition. In terms of like now, all those times when I'm alone and how, and you asked me like how, like how do I go out in public and just like just go because yeah. 19 years old. I'm now, quote unquote, a millionaire, and now I have life in front of me. My dad's still working. My sister's in college. My friends are all in school. So now I'm in Cleveland in this three-bedroom penthouse that I'm like just dolo in. I didn't have anything to do with the furniture except for the bed. I took Tempur-Pedic for sure. <laughs> yeah, so I had to take that. And yeah. then um, also shout out to Casper, by the way. Um, yeah, shout yeah. out to Casper. For sure, shout out to Casper. Bread. <laughs> um the the uh the flip side of that was just now I'm with my thoughts by myself in Cleveland, in Cleveland too. like there's not much to do in Cleveland I'm 19 years old I'm there and then now you bring on your rookie you're in the gym every single day you're playing every single other day this is a lockout season we start our season in December so now we they had a back to back to back for us I'm looking at our veterans like, what the hell are we doing here? Is this the NBA? Yeah. Well, back to back. I get tired after playing 40 minutes with my friends. Like, yeah. now you want me to play back to back to back? So my rookie season, you know, and then you combine that with uh, some losing. Yeah. And then, yeah. You know. Rough. Yeah. So that was just a Those are some dark, frustrating. Like, yeah. I had my first three years were probably, I probably faced some of the. No, I would say, yeah, and I would say my first five years. I would say my last six years. I would say all of them. <laughs> I would say. All of them have been a ride. All of them have been an experience. All of them. Man. God damn it, yeah. man. Did you ever, like, number one, when you came your first year at the Cavs, mm -hmm. you didn't get any bad press or bad anything. I mean, you did well, right? Yeah, no, I mean, the Cavs we, we won a few games, but we didn't win as many as I think that we should have, especially the things I know now. But as a rookie, I'm not in the NBA shape. My body isn't fully developed. I'm playing as grown men every single night. Now I'm getting bumped and bruises. So my first three years were like this. Yeah, they were yeah, yeah. really like that. I was Sorry. just trying to wrap my head around. Like there was no like sort no. of all this pressure built up and then something like you underperformed, right? No, no. I mean, I ended up winning rookie of the year, so it was – I was in competition with, and that was the next year. So it was no when I first got drafted. No, well, yeah. When then, how long until you won Rookie of the Year? That was April. The, so yeah. we played from December till April, and then that's quick. won Rookie of the Year. 
and it was up for me and Ricky Rubio, and you know, that I want Ricky Rubio. I mean, then that's... I had my speech at the NBA conference, then went on into the summertime. That's when I played against the USA team yeah. at um, in Vegas, and they were the 2012 Olympic team was Kobe, Braun, Melo, Blake, Darren. Blake and didn't end up playing in that. I think he did something with his kneecap. CP, like they had a shit ton of people. Eric Gordon was on the team. Rudy Gay, like they had Tyson Chandler. They had a whole bunch of guys, and they brought it. They basically brought in me, Clay Thompson. Who else? I'm trying to think. Just, no, um, Dewan Blair, a few other guys that we had on our Gordon, Gordon Hayward. They, we were all young. We were all 19, 20, 21. Did you feel like, what the fuck am I doing here? No, nah, I was just like, let's get it. Really? I was like, this is what I wanted. I wanted to go straight Russ, all those guys. Like, it was when we were in 2012 when all those guys, like, they were still developing into the superstars. Like, we had Braun and all them, but <clears throat> the superstars that they're now. Yeah. Like, James was, James played. So those guys were all still relatively young, and I was fresh off my rookie year. So we were all relatively like they were still in their early like twenties. Yeah. So I went in there, and then they just started talking a shit ton, like to all of us. Like, and then when it got the to the older point, guys or the yeah, other the guys? older guys because they wanted we were the select team, and yeah. we were playing against the USA team. So as a as a select team member. You get disrespected, like you, <laughs> oh, like you're not getting the ball every single time because we're there only to help them practice. Yeah. So we're, you know, we're the kind of throwaway team, like not the throwaway team, but we're the we're the practice yeah, squad. Yeah, we're the practice the, squad. The guinea pigs or whatever. And yeah. I, I just remember, out of all numbers, guess what number I had? I had twenty three. I had number twenty three randomly. Like they gave me number. I was like, bet I have the best <laughs> jersey here. I do. I do. And you never felt like, uh, like you've never came, had a moment on the court where like. It's just some OG, and you're like, oh, damn it, I'm out, I'm outnumbered here. Like, what do you mean? I just mean like going against like a dude who's been in the league forever and oh, a yeah. fucking legend, and you used to yeah. look up to. Like, you ever run up on the court and have that moment of like, no, nah, fuck, sure. what's even happening? Yeah, like, what for sure, it? with Kobe, for sure. That was the first. You know, that well, was what do like, you do? Then you just click back into like game mode. And you're like, okay, you have wanna... to, you have to, but it's cool to watch him though. I'll tell you that. I bet from he standing like, right next to him. He was like, yo, I'm going to be honest with you. This was when he came, when we came my rookie year to L.A. Mm -hmm. When we played, he was just on, he was on a streak of about three or four games straight of 40 plus. Yeah. So when he came to us and I rewatched those highlights, he was killing us. Uh -huh. But while I'm in the game. I'm just watching him, like, <laughs> yeah. and I'm just taking the ball out, and I'm taking the possession. So but as you rewatch it in my rookie year, I'm like, dang, Kobe was ridiculous. Man, yeah. Kobe is ridiculous still. But yeah, I just can't imagine. I can't imagine looking up to someone for a long time, and then all of a sudden you just walk out onto the court and you're playing them. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Like that just has to be a pretty trippy, like. Feeling. No, it's it's cool. It's cool, but also it's a realization of where 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 you are. Yeah. You know, like it just you're in a you're in a pretty. You're in a pretty special place. Yeah. If these guys are walking on the court and playing and performing like with you. So that was that was always cool. Yeah, and, no, yeah. I get it. Did yeah. you ever any any time in that like the first few years at Cleveland, did you you never thought about not want quitting or Where? you know what I'm saying? Like just meaning like when you said it was kind of dark and it was just kind of lonely and just kinda like what the fuck? Like, did you ever think like I don't love this right now? Or <laughs> or it never got that bad? It it's always it's gotten to that point. Yeah. I think every human being goes to that point where it's mm -hmm. just like it's just so bad at one time you're just like, Why am I doing this, man? Why am I getting up? Like, why am I giving this maximum effort if something's not getting returned and it's just like the work and the amount of work and then you add injuries to it, then you add struggles of just being young. Yeah. You know, like that's the thing that I think that some people like fail to realize in terms of these these sports and like the lifestyle of being out in the open and having all that. There's still life that has to be lived from yeah. these youthful individuals that are given an opportunity, are given you know a, a, some money, and then they're giving uh, that platform, which they don't even understand what platform they're on because they haven't made a decision in terms of what they're 
truly believing in. Until yeah. that happens and you shape who you are, then it's always going to be like that. So, yeah. you know, I've never been more direct and honest in my life than the point I am now. But as you look back then, some dark times, man, like just really, really just building who I was, you know, just taking off layers and layers and removing layers of uncomfortable feelings that I had and uncomfortable things in my life. Yeah. Making changes, making changes, consistently making changes, trying out shit, you know, having different girlfriends, having different, you know, lifestyles that I honestly like, but I don't love and traveling places and then playing basketball and then working on my game. And you combine all that. Yeah. And that's just in the realm of basketball in which I live in. And then you take all of that outside and then you bring in like my family and my relationships with them. And then you take that realm and then you bring it to another realm. And then there's like the world and yeah. always being safe and prepared. And then there's like multiple realms that I had to live in <laughs> yeah. that you got to develop. And then on top of that, perform at a high level. Yeah. In front of a shit ton of people. Yep. And get roasted if you don't. Yep. That's what I, man. Yep. Did you have like a mentor? Do you have anyone helping you through that? Like, or yeah. was it a lot of people? Uh, my, my dad uh, has been consistently, consistently been in that mentor role. But as I started getting older, um, I started reaching out and just started really observing. Mm -hmm. So started watching um you know just a lot more videos things that would inspire me and then i just started doing a shit ton of reading and yeah. then i just figured out and some things that you know about this world some universal truths that you just have to accept in order to be living at a at a maximum level yeah. as, a, as a human so you talk to your dad about like the partying stuff and the girls or no there's other people of course i mean my dad my dad you have that type of relationship yeah you just talk that's about like anything? call him right now man what's up man yeah so man, that's it's cool. Good. Yeah, dude, how you doing? Just checking in, man. <laughs> but he just gets it. Like he gets all the any of the struggles or the yeah. what's going on. But my on. dad also, like I said, my dad is. I swear, I don't know where he comes from, but he <laughs> he like he saw all of this at one time too with my uh, my uncle Rod, who yeah. was in the NBA, Rod Strickland. So Got his it. birthday just passed. Happy birthday, Uncle! And then they uh. You know, my dad saw the NBA lifestyle, but God. it wasn't, it was just different from my life, but it was also along the similar traits, like, you know, yeah. going out and my dad, you know, obviously putting a babysitter for me and my sister, but, um, you know, going out, staying out till seven in the morning and yeah. going straight from the club and then going st straight to Wall Street and working and just doing what, you know, 29 and 28, yeah. 27 year olds do. He was just... Experience yeah. in life. That's you know, just the shit that's kids, hard so to just... learn. Like, there's no nobody, like, it's hard to learn those lessons. Man. And sometimes people just go through them and learn the hard way. You know what I'm saying? But yeah. it's not like you can learn kind of what how to navigate college or you can learn kind of yeah. how to navigate. You can ask the coach or whatever. But, like, learning all those weird fucking distractions and other shit that comes with all of that yeah. is rough. It's always going to be there, though. That, yeah. That's one thing I came to realize is that that lifestyle is always constant. It's never stopping. It's not going anywhere. Yeah, like the, yeah. The fast lifestyle of being in parties, the girls, that whole being in there is like, it's always going to be there. Yeah. If you want to partake, partake. If you don't, then it's fine as well. Yeah, yeah. Nobody is... Mm -mm. Yeah, it's, part, it's part, yeah, it's part of like it's just part of the culture. Like that's what happens. People love hearing good music and drinking and having a good time. Yeah. Nothing wrong not with that. Stop. There's nothing yeah. wrong with that. It's just I feel like there's always just judgment in terms of when people want to do what the hell they want to do. Like, yeah. Bro, just as long well, as that's being why it must safe be so hard for you. I mean if he's being safe then yeah. and he's taking care of what he needs to take care of his responsibilities, then let him be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let him be. Why not? But it's like with internet him. age, right? It's like everyone wants to talk about it or write a blog post about yeah. Kyrie was a live. You no, know, I always say it. I always say it that they, you know, like when when some people take out their camera phones, I ask them like, "Do you want to take a picture or video of me doing normal things?" Yeah. Like I'm just yeah, no, yeah, I'm just, I get like, it. I'm, I'm just going to get something to eat. Like, yeah. I, but I'll take a picture with you. I don't mind that. I don't mind that. But if it's just when you take a picture of me like talking just, like, or dinner, doing something, yeah. I'm just like, yeah, it's weird, bro. Like, come on, it's just yeah. a normal activity. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we can take a picture afterwards, bro. Just let me enjoy this moment that I have right now. Yeah, like, see, without something being captured by someone else. But I'm more or less cool with it now when people just pull out their phone and stuff. I'm like, man, yeah, you whatever, get used to it. Man. I think. Like, just whatever, man. I it's feel like just, it's cool. Like, I don't mind it. Whatever. Well, you just can't. There's nothing you can do. Yeah, that's what right? I'm saying. Like, I'm you might as like, well just be okay with it because yeah, there's like, literally don't no bother way around me. it. Yeah. Right, just give them a quick, quick, 
What up? All right, bro. Yeah. Be on your way. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> um, so what, uh, take me through when like shit sort of turned around at Cleveland and when you started to feel like, oh shit, there's something special going on here. Uh, or did it not feel like that to you? My going into my fourth year when I signed my extension with Cleveland, that's when things really started to turn. And um, I happened, you know, I, after I met with our owner and we discussed the extension and, you know, everything that happened then, we agreed to terms. Everybody else was sleeping in my house. And, like they were all sleeping. Oh, like you literally sleeping. They were all sleeping. They were in the house because I had a dinner in New York. And we had it at like eleven thirty, yeah, eleven fifteen, eleven thirty, because we couldn't necessarily dis like discuss the terms until twelve a.m. Like yep. that was just the day. So um, once we did that, uh, I left the meeting. I was ecstatic. I went and got two Don P bottles. Yeah, just clashing them, clanking them things. I was Damn. just in the spot Dolo. Wait, in New York? I yeah, I was I was in Avenue Dolo, like just. Did you get a table? <sighs> yeah, I'm, I'm literally <laughs> standing like, I want a table, and I swear to you, I have, my, I have like a, I have a button up on, with a coat, with some slacks and some shoes, and I'm in there like, ah, I'm with Cleveland. <laughs> ah, I'm like, you can't tell me nothing. I'm FaceTiming them on my way back home. And I'm like, what are y'all doing? What are you doing? What? Are, we're not sleeping. We're not sleeping. We're not Damn sleeping. It. Yeah, of course they went back to sleep like an hour. Yeah, like shut up. I was Kyrie, like, bro, guess what happened? It. I told them I was like, bro, they offered me, they offered me this. That's what I'm assigned for. I'm here. Let's do it. And then probably about a week later, Fuck. Bron comes back. Oh, so you didn't even know that when you resigned? Mm -mm. I didn't. Damn. So you resigned. You resigned also not really knowing like, fuck, this could be. I knew the direction of the team, and we had just hired our uh, uh, head coach David Blatt with. Yeah. Uh, Coach Teron Lou as the assistant. So we were all there meeting. Yeah. And then, you know, they were telling me about the offense, telling me how the season was going to go, what was going to happen. But you were in regardless. Yeah, yeah I was in. I was God in. damn it. So then LeBron decides to come back. How do you find out about that? You get a phone call or something? Yep. And are you, what's your feeling on that? Like, were you like, oh I, shit? No, it was just, I we're knew that. Kill it. Yeah, no, I, <laughs> I was excited about it because at the time, I didn't know what to expect because I knew that things were going to, start happening yeah. because I was like, okay, things are getting more serious. Like I know that we had just drafted uh, Andrew Wiggins. Yeah. So, I, and you hear like the trade rumors and stuff like that. So you knew that something big was going to happen. Then we get K-Love. Yeah. So now we start shaping the team and we get Sean Marion, we get Mike Miller, we get James Jones, we get Brandon Haywood, we get, you know, just these veteran guys. We get Kendrick Perkins door to end towards the end of the season, we get Dante Jones. So, so you just feel like this momentum. Yeah, like the momentum starting to, to shift. And then, you know, then now you have to figure out how to coexist. Yep. You have to figure out how to exist as teammates now because before the part was I didn't understand that is and I didn't have an, enough appreciation for it at the time when I was younger and I do now. It's just at the time that I'm spending with all these guys, they are getting a very, very intimate look in terms of who I am. Yeah at all times, sometimes more than my family gets to see. Yeah. So I'm around them every single day and I'm working and now you have to figure out how this environment can be conducive for everyone here to still feel like they can be themselves yeah. in a very comfortable setting while still playing at a very high level and the expectations are sky high because of the talent that we're surrounded with. So you combat all that stuff yeah, and then so you try much. to mix it in, then you know, you just you just function as a team, man. That that's one of the biggest things is that in team sports that it's just like the camaraderie and the chemistry is something unmatched because yeah. you end up seeing someone in a very, very new light because you get to see the ups and downs. Yeah. You get to see the, and competing know, to yeah. the maximum yeah. potential that they can physically and mentally get. Yep. Like it's and insane. then while still dealing with the same factors that I deal with, which is life, yeah. you know, like their family, yeah. like their 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 goals, their intentions. And... Do people talk about that like to the other teammates, or you or does everyone kind of leave that? Like, what's standard procedure there? I mean, you can have you can have team talks about it, and you know, you have a meeting with everyone. But it's more or less you have to come to an understanding once everyone starts getting used to one another. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. Um, 
<clears throat> and did it come together pretty quickly? Like once you got all the new guys, no, I don't know. No, no, it didn't come together. Quickly <laughs> and so you at feel all. it? Do you feel like, like do you feel like, damn, we got all these guys and shit, but like this is just not clicking. At first, yeah. And then slowly yeah. you feel it because I was coming. I was coming off a, <clears throat> I was coming off a pretty good summer. I had just come back from Barcelona, yeah, um, with the USA squad competing for the FIBA World Cup. So um, I won MVP out there, and then flew back home, and we came into the season. I was in the I was in unbelievable shape. I was already ready for the season. So as the season is progressing, you know, like uh, just different things started happening, like that happens within a season, especially a new team. Yeah. So we had to, you know, just make a few changes. It was a constant roller coaster in that, and then we ended up making it all the way to the finals, and then we lost that first year. That wasn't the year. Was that the year you got hurt, or was it the year before? No, it was the year before. Oh, no, no, actually, that was the year. Yep, I got hurt game one of the finals, 2015. That was finals. that was LeBron's first year back. Yep. God damn it! Um, damn it! So you guys, I mean, on the road there, that first was year Golden back with State Cleveland, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah first year yeah, back. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, I don't know why I thought. I don't know why I thought there was one year before that. So the first year back was you guys in Golden State. That's when you got hurt right before the finals, mm -hmm. right? And uh, the year before, I think it was Spurs. He. Yep. Yep. You're right. What? Uh, did you feel like you guys were gonna win that year? The that the first year? year, the first year that he came back, or did you know that it? Just yeah, didn't we feel... didn't know what to expect because that was my first year in the playoffs. So yeah. now, you know, that was Kevin's first year in the playoffs. Then we had a bunch of veterans, and you know, we had a, a coach that that was his first year in the playoffs. Yeah. So now we have you know just a whole bunch of making up to do that we have to fill in because. That right there, when the playoffs hit, it's like the intensity goes twenty fold. Like yeah, I could I say forty fold. It's just you get to you get to scheme and scout a team for to win four games. You're gonna know everything about them. The physicality goes up. The refs let us play, and the just the magnitude of every moment and every possession. It's just in the playoffs. Every play is a big play. So like everything the, feels every different. time you and you guys know this. Like every time. In the playoffs, when a team scores, the crowd goes absolutely nuts yeah, during the playoffs. Yeah. Like you would think that it was the game-winning basket. Like yeah. it's just every shot in the playoffs. Like, <gasps> like it's just, whoa, this is new. Fuck. And so. does that start the first game of the playoffs? Even the first game of the playoffs, do you feel like, oh shit, this is something different? Yeah, yeah. But at my first game, I was, I was ready. I was ready. Well, I you, you weren't 30. nervous. I had thirty. We got the <laughs> W. My first game in the yeah. playoffs. Yeah. And I was just ready for that moment, I, because those type of uh, those type of moments right there, I, I was destined for man. Like every big moment, there's something to capture in it. Like I'm, I was meant to be there. I, that top level competition, yeah, of like just really nitty gritty, and you and you need more from me. I will give that to you and some. And because I like, guess that's, that's just the way I that's the way I. That's yeah. the way I'm built. Yeah, I need yeah. like, I need that. I want that. I want to take. I want to take those shots. I want to be part of that. I want to do something special. In, Were you more moments. nervous at the draft than you are during a playoff game? Yeah, a lot more. Because I hadn't made the league yet. And it just sounds like when something's like in your control, like yeah, yeah, competitively, yeah. like okay, I can go well, do anything, that. Anything in my life, right? That, As yeah, opposed to sure. like, I don't know when they're gonna call me. How this shit works? Yeah. Where the fuck do I even? Nah. But that's normal, though. That's natural. Yeah, that's natural. Those, those things are like natural. Well, for some, I mean, I would much rather be sitting in an NBA draft than to be <laughs> walking out onto the court of an NBA playoff. Personally, <laughs> <laughs> that's more preferable. Uh, um, so, when you got hurt in that first playoffs, like, were you super devastated by that, or or when I got hurt? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. This is when the rock comes up. Oh, the fucking rock! It's when the rock comes okay, up. Okay, what is it? So. When that happened, I had a crack in my knee that I... You're, oh, pre before yeah, that. From the rock. Shit. So, oh, so you just got stitches. I got stitches. Didn't... This was in fifth grade, though. But I had I ended up having a crack in, your kneecap. in my kneecap that wasn't necessarily getting bigger, but it was it was cracked from trying Damn. to do that ollie over the rock. Fucking so, skateboarding almost fucked your whole shit up. No, I, it fucked my shit up. <laughs> <laughs> my shit up. Like, I felt like it fucked my shit up. Like, God damn it. For a little bit. You didn't have knee pain bit. like that you noticed no. throughout the time? Until, see, this is 
Like this is this is when it gets like this is when life hits. This is what I'm yeah. talking about when life hits. So yeah. that's when uh yeah, I started feeling stuff around like Boston. Okay. Uh, when I got to Boston, then um at, almost after the Boston series, that's when I found out that I was gonna be having a daughter. Mm -hmm. So now when that happens now, no like there's no way to like really prepare for having a kid. Yeah, so it's just imagine. like there's no way that you can like prepare yourself except reach out to other people. So now all that starts transpiring. Now I start getting hurt. Now my knee starts hurting and you know, now I'm like trying to figure things out and then I keep playing because now, you know, I'm gonna play hurt in the playoffs. Like yeah. it doesn't matter if you know, if it, if I me being out here is is for the betterment of the team, I'm willing to do. Yeah. I'm willing to take that sacrifice. So Going into the finals, I had, you know, about 10 days before the finals, I felt as good as I had during the playoffs. You know, I was hobbling in the Atlanta series, then I came into the finals. I was ready to go, and then literally one play, boom. Klay Thompson hits me in the right spot at the right time, and then my knee, like, like just fractured. What and happened? I'm, he just ran into you? No, like, I tried to stop. I tried to go behind my back and stop, Yeah. and his momentum kept carrying him, and then his knee... Uh, went into the front of my kneecap and uh -huh. then when I did it, I automatically fell to the ground. And I'm like, oh wow. I was like, that's a feeling I've never felt before. I have felt pain before, but now it was like, damn, this is a different type of pain. Yeah. And then I look at our trainer and I'm like, I'm like, I gotta go to the back. Like I have to go to the back. And I went in the back and my my shit was like Instantly. they were both they were both there. Like I, my whole all the way down here, like just a whole bunch of atrophy and just like it was just swollen and I knew I was done so I tried to lighten up the mood the next day with my friends and family because I knew how worried they were for for me and just for my my mental sake so I lightened up the mood completely I was like guys listen like it's okay like I'm gonna be all right we can laugh a little you know, it's fine. Like we can still tell jokes. Like yeah. you guys don't have to be all serious and shit. Because they were all like, they didn't know how to. They didn't know how to react because they knew I was hurt. Yeah, yeah. And and when you see a brother, your brother hurt, or a family member hurt, they were just like, no, yeah, it's a you don't know yeah. what to say. So I was, you know, I was like, it's gonna be all right. And then I flew back. Uh, I flew back home. I did my surgery about seven a.m. Woke up and you know my whole knee was in a cast. And from that point on, it was like. It was a whole bunch of life still to be lived. And you watched the rest of the finals, like from the hospital bed, yep. right? Yep. So did the doctor just, the doctor said like, hey, you had a fracture on your kneecap and that's why this happened extra easily. Mm -hmm. But my knee was already weak. Man. So it was like just a ticking time. He hit me at the right spot at the right time. And I felt, and I, you know, kind of took the, that's crazy. Took the fall. Um, yep. And then that summer was like, that's where, all of, like where all of us start to grow and become closer and because they, your friend yeah they now were like i loved them to death mm -hmm. simply for the fact because they were carrying me in and out of that range rover yeah. and, you know allowing me to drive my lambo when i shouldn't have like yeah. i'm forcing it like drama i'm telling you i used to take i used to take my crutches put them in the passenger seat with the top down. I took the top down every time we were in Miami. I was living in Miami. <laughs> Put the crutches, and I would literally, like, it would take me probably about a minute 20 to get in that car. Yeah. Like, because my oh, knee, yeah. I didn't have all the it's like sitting on the degrees ground. in my knee. So, like, <laughs> now I'm, like, hopping in, and, like, I'm getting in the car, and I'm hopping out, and I still can barely move my leg. But the fact that I still wanted to be so independent because I didn't want to put all of my reliance in them because yeah. that's just how I naturally am. But they were always like, yo, Kai, like, why are you doing this? Like, yeah. I'm like, Mike, I got it. I got it. Yeah. Leave me yeah. be. I yeah. got it. Like, yo, don't <laughs> stop helping me. And they were like, come on, man. Like, we're here to help. Like, I'm like, yo, no. So, you know, just <laughs> like the movie scene. Yeah, man. Like, but in oh, a Lambo. stop helping me. Yeah, like, stop. Let me get fine. off. And like, but it's a Lamborghini. Let me get you know, off. Like, Let like me this get off. Sad scene. Yeah. But it's like, I want to drive my Lambo. Yeah. <laughs> I remember that night we went out in Miami. You came with crutches and a thing. You were like in the club with your leg up. Like, yo, what's good? <laughs> oh, my god. I was goodness. like, damn, it's cool. Oh, man. Bro, it's <laughs> Nothing a uh, summer in Miami. That's just a fix, force. You know? Force. 
I was forcing it, John. We call that when you're doing something like real extra that you're not supposed to be doing, it's called a force. But I mean, it's the same as like force. I know. don't care what you say, John. I should not have been getting in that Lamborghini. Like, no way. Eh. No way. How old were you? 20, 23. 23? Come on. 23. Give a 23 year old a Lamborghini, Lamborghini with a fractured you can cut off his though. legs and he'd be like, fuck it. No, nah, you're right. You're I'm right. hopping in. I this don't regret thing. it. But, you no. know. But then that's when I started just picking up books and. Uh, a friend of mine gave me a book, uh, Osho, uh, Emotions, which was the first book that really started revolutionizing the way I just started thinking and feeling, man. Just started becoming more in touch with myself. Yeah. And then, you know, from that point on, it's just been just getting the wheels going. Was know? that a big ramp up in, in book passion yeah. for you that time? Yeah, man. I started reading a whole bunch of Osho and then Jiru Krishnamurti that started evolving after couple couple months and you know just talking with different people and experiencing different things and yeah reaching out and just stop being so fucking stubborn and and just ask for help when you need it you yeah. know because there's so many people out here that ha have to offer so much knowledge that i you know it's good to receive that sometimes yeah. instead yeah. of thinking that you know the world is always against you and it's just you and it's just like i had to let go of that that arrogance of just being so independent all the time like there are people to help you feel like you sort of had that the whole time and then that was the moment you got rid of it or did it build up at a certain time for some reason? Well, just a lot of the fears that they, you know, when you're not necessarily having a release, which is basketball and emotional release, you yeah. know, a, a secondary, um, you know, activity that you can do that you know will probably put you in a better mood or probably put you in a better headspace. Yeah. So, um, so it just made it 20 times worse. Like any negative. Yeah, all the fears because it got to the point where I'm I'm on a bed and, I, and I'm looking. I'm like, man, if I really wanted to stand up right now, I really couldn't mm -hmm. just because my, my, my leg is so weak. So mm -hmm. I'm like, damn. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like when I get back to playing basketball, like will I be able to just walk all right? I hope I do this rehab the right way. Like I... You don't. You're just thinking about a whole bunch of things that can go wrong. That was going to be my question. Like, did you get as like as into the darkness of like I might never be able to play the same again? Like, this could really be it, or not really? Did no, you know? no. It was it was some extra motivation in there because you know now you start thinking about the next thing to do. The ne It was the. It was always going to be the next thing. Like, okay, we we we've we've gotten this degrees today. Now, what can we do tomorrow? Can we add something? And I. The will just and the motivation yeah. and it just started it just started coming out of me naturally because there there's there is no way to just stop like just give up yeah. like just stop loving life basically and things that you love to do it's yeah. like motherfucker you better pick your ass up and you better keep trucking on yeah. like if you don't if you don't knock it off <laughs> like that's <laughs> yeah. how I'm talking about so like you don't knock it off right now are you kidding me you're gonna be better yeah. you're gonna be better you're gonna be you're going to be able to do even more things just because of the things that you, you weren't paying attention to before. Now the maniacal details that you were missing, now you have people that are helping you with it. So I hired, you know, my strength and conditioning coach. He lives with me, Robin Pound. Then I, you know, I'd start, I reached out to Fusionetics, which, which, would, which uh, was Trevor Harrison, who ended up working with Kobe when he was coming back from his Achilles. And then they rehabbed a whole bunch of other injuries. So now I started reaching out. Now I'm going to my coach, my coach Handy. And now we're getting quality basketball workouts and now I start taking my body and my food and like my diet and yeah. things just all the details that allow all of this to perform on the court. I was missing those yeah. before because I was, you know, I was just I'm 23, I'm 22. Like I'm in good shape. I'm in great shape. Like I eat what I want. I do yeah. what I want. You know, um, I just signed a freaking huge contract. Like what? A, like, and then you hit boom, fracture kneecap. Now what? Yeah. <laughs> now it's like, it puts you back like square one. So, yeah, that's nuts. Like almost in a way, it seems like that kind of helped in the long run. For sure. That that's that that's what I'm saying. After that's when it started really making sense, and then I knew that I had to start developing more things for myself and getting to know myself a lot better in order to be successful in life. Yeah. Not just basketball, man. Because that that right there, if I can be able to still resonate with people and still be able to connect with people outside of the game of basketball like he's a good basketball player but like bro like he's just 
I'm just myself, and yeah, I wanted yeah, yeah. to. I want to represent that, and I want that to be perfectly fine with everyone else because I respect that. I welcome that in. I welcome in new energies. Yeah. I told you I bridge the gap. Yeah, you should. Sure I bridge the gap. You sure so do. you know, that's yeah, always man. cool. Um, how long was it from like time of injury to like starting to play again? Hmm. Or even starting to practice again? I got injured June. First, I want to say, I didn't play again until December twelfth. But I didn't really start playing probably until like February, like really playing, playing. Mm -hmm. Like those first two months, I was just playing like, just playing thirteen minutes, twelve minutes sprinkled in here and there, and I'm like, man, I'm so <laughs> out of shape right now, and yeah. the game is so fast. I remember when I first got back into the game, I had this wide open layup. It could have been my first two points. I came in the lane. I'm just like, ah, hung in the air. I was like, ah, this is easy. And missed it. Missed it. <laughs> and then Bron, I didn't I didn't end up scoring. I think until like the second quarter or end of the first. Bron gave me a outlet pass and then laid it up. Yeah. So that yeah. But that really sparked a, something in me from that injury that has continued um my quest. Yeah. Yeah. Was it that year that you guys won? Yep. Damn. How year dumb. of the monkey. Oh, yeah, you're right. yeah, 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 you're right. Year of the monkey. Because we went to a game. We went to game six in Cleveland when Golden State won. And it was the most depressing night in Cleveland I've ever. You mean game five? Was no, it five? Game three. No. Game three. No, I'm talking no about... game four they won. Game four they won at home against us. Game four. You're game... saying the fourth game at home. No, 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 the no, no. I'm saying when they won the whole series, the first, not the year you guys won the finals, the first year of the three when you were oh, hurt. oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Remember I texted oh, you six. and I'm like, oh, I'm out here. Yeah, when they won the chip and six. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was the worst. It was the most depressing night in Cleveland because you know, like it's Cleveland and, and they love it so much and they're yeah. so excited mm -hmm. and I don't know if it's like that in every city, but Cleveland gets no, really guess. fucking pumped. But yeah. then when they lost at home, it was the most depressing. Like we were trying to find a place to eat pizza and it was like you, everything's closed. Fuck you, go home. <laughs> like it was terrible. I don't blame him. Yeah, I don't blame him. At um, all. So then you come back the next year. You're back in the finals again, mm -hmm. and once again that energy is just insane. Yep. But like I knew exactly what we wanted to accomplish, and we went in with a primary goal, got down three one, and then the rest is so history. Nuts. And you had you felt twice as prepared that year than the year before because I was, of all your, you know, healthier. Yeah, but I didn't know what to, you know, I didn't know what to expect. I knew that it was a, a higher level, but I had I I was fully healthy. You know, and I was feeling good, but I also knew that this level was about to be different. It was just about to be different in the finals. In yeah. my first two games, I struggled. Yeah, and then for the rest of the series, I played pretty well. I can't believe like. You're telling me when you guys were down 3-1, like you go out on game five, like, fuck it, we still got this. We were, we were in a good headspace. We just knew that, the, you know, I always say, you know, when that when your back is against the wall, yeah, man, I, it's the fact that you have to be against the wall in order for you to want to. It's too bad you can't just like force that. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, like that, you know, but. But that's how you get yeah. those great moments. Yeah. So. Oh, that's insane. What about that feeling of like when it just hit and you know that you won it all? <clears throat> I hugged my coach. You know, I'm hugging out everybody. Make sure you get the hugs in. Thank you, kisses. I'm, you know, I'm texting all these guys. They're freaking drunk as hell at the crib, <laughs> you know, going crazy that we just won. So now it's like celebration starts to sink in yeah. a little bit, you know, and it felt good. I hugged my dad and my sister. I gave him my, my jersey. And I kept it pushing. Did you guys go to Vegas? Yeah. Straight, straight to Vegas. Vegas. Straight to Vegas. I couldn't believe it. We flew, we flew straight to Vegas, which was cool. And then we flew to Cleveland. That whole plane was silent. Well, on the way for which home. one? On the way to Cleveland? No, but on the way back from Vegas to Cleveland, that whole plane was silent. Why? Because everyone was just <laughs> exhausted? Was, yes. <laughs> Had zero. It was just celebration, man. Yeah. So and then we, and then we wake up, and it's thousands of people at the freaking airport thousands just uh, waiting they have like a full-blown stage set up at the airport and people are just going ham they're going bananas 
Yeah, it was on bananas. And, and I, I forgot got how home. crazy that parade it was. It was like 30 kids waiting on the lawn, like just chanting. And I'm like, I want to go to sleep. <laughs> oh, man. I want to go to sleep. But overall, it was a good experience, man. And then you go to the parade, which there's like 5 million yeah, people. Yeah, it was unbelievable, man. I've never seen anything like that. I've was, never seen anything like that. It was like, it was ridiculous. Yeah, it's insane. I it wish I would have went home for that. I really that you, do. That would have been. Man, if I would have had any idea, because you guys won the, you guys won the finals in Golden State, right? Mm-hmm. Got and it. then flew back home. Yeah, if I would have known, I would have came just for that. Man, bro, that it was nuts. Was winning that was winning that final game like top moment in in NBA career or or no? It's one of them. Yeah, there there like there are a few moments where you can never forget. But that that was definitely 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 up there. Yeah, yeah that was an unbelievable. Unbelievable game against an unbelievably talented team. And it was just, you know, one for the books. Everybody mm-hmm. wanted to see Cavs was going to stay. I mean, it's been happening like that for the last three years. So, yeah. Man wants to and see probably it. again this year. Uh, after it's done, like after you get the ring and after you do that, like, do you feel personally like I did it? Or do you feel like, all right, how do I get six more of these things? It's that one, huh? It's Damn that it, one, that's man. the gift and the curse. Yeah, you know it's There's like you always want so more, hard. man. You just, I know. You know, I was they, I was playing pickup two days after the game seven. Yeah, I was ready to yeah. go. I was. We kept we you know, we celebrated, but it was like after that, it was, I had to. I took about two weeks off, and then I had to start getting ready for the Olympics. Got it. God damn it, man. Yep. So this was this is the first summer that I've really just had mostly a summer like yep. Yep. like a solid month yep other than that i've been working um a couple more and i'll let you go what uh what's what's next in the in the sense of obviously next in in basketball but then what do you see like sort of the longer term, the 20 year, the, Mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Like, what do you want? Do you have any big sort of aspirations of like, here's what I want my thing to look like or? Absolutely. What? Like, like just meaning like, what I usually say is like, let's picture you're 75 years old and you're sitting on your porch and you're kind of just happy and content with your life. And like, you look back on what you did. Oh, there goes Al again. It's that, you know, it's, uh, uh, it's eating (laughs) eating all the carrots in the farm. (laughs) There go jig. Running around with the kids again. It's it's what does that look like? <laughs> Motherfucking crazy, man. <laughs> Been telling them for twenty years, man, doing the same thing. <laughs> no, but that that look definitely looks like I have I have pretty they're I don't want that they they're never lofty, but you know, the the idea of, you know, just a self sustaining community that ultimately exists with just everyone has quality but just built around a culture that is being driven by individuals that are selected amongst us amongst us as a community that Mm -hmm. we all want to stay close to so you know we're just working on a plan where ultimately we can accomplish that on a on a grander scale of a lot of acres, farmable land, and basically buy that land and then start building my own damn community. How many people are in this community? That's what I'm saying. These these are this is just the these are like literally just the layout of what we want to accomplish. Yeah. And now you start filling in how you accomplish it. Yeah. So or how many we have people the, or how all that other Yeah, stuff. but we have some people, but we need we need more. And we'll like hundreds? they'll they'll, they'll We'll find we'll find each other yeah. in terms of how do you accomplish something like that that you have a self sustaining society or a community that ultimately is all together and then you don't have to worry about outside anything mm-hmm. that's the goal. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't want to say not worry about outside, but there are things that you figure out that you're just like that just makes sense, man. Like the fact that it costs a shit ton to be healthy like yeah. that it costs like a whole bunch of money to get fresh organic non what is it not what do they put on eggs now like non farm rate like like free range yeah, eggs yeah, yeah. like and it's just like yeah so you're telling me that these organic eggs that like you just 
what's the difference? Yeah. And then just the quality of food and things that in this crazy world, man, that you, I always say it to my friends, man, you, the fact that you have to pay to play in this world is ridiculous, yeah. man. Like you really have to pay to play. Mm -hmm. Like you have, to, you have to pay your phone bill. Like you have to, you have to pay for the spot that you're, that you're living in right now. You have to pay for your clothes. You have to pay for your hat. You have to pay for your shirt. Yeah, yeah, and then yeah. on top of that, you want to throw in some jewelry. And then you like, then you start, there's a separate class that they, that they've all, that they put us in because of money. Yeah. And ultimately the self-sustaining community is like, if I give him my $5 and he has, he's selling these specific herbs and spices. And then I go to Al and I buy something from him and he has a self-sustaining store. And then I go to whack and then I'm like, I want this. And then, okay, now I just gave that money to whack. Wack has to go see Al. Yeah. Al has to go see Josh. Yeah, yeah, Josh yeah. has to come see me. Where does the dollar actually go? Yeah. It stays within all of us. Yeah. So now our value of a dollar is like, now when somebody comes in, we can charge whatever we want. Will we charge an absurd amount? Hell no. But it's like, now it becomes like one dollar is washing the other. Yeah. And it's just, it's all within the community rather than it just being taken away and you know, like it's just yeah, it's got pay to play, man. I get it. But the hopefully the I can at least like yeah. come hang out. No, come on in man. the community. Come on, man. That like I hope you. There were, were a few when years, you like but, got it all figured out. Yeah, and you have like this we're, fucking happy community. I want to be able to come visit. No, you. Bro, we'll talk. <laughs> okay, thanks. <laughs> um, okay, last two. Number one, if you had unlimited money, whatever you can put, uh, you can put billboards all over every major city in the country. What's on the billboard? Um. Oh man, don't uh don't be afraid to give love, man. You deserve it, and the world deserves it. Yeah. And I would just leave it at that. Yeah. And love, that power, of love, man, and energy seeking, that that's all driven inside of us. That like it's all inside of us, and we all carry it with us. The aura and energy that we carry with carry us carry with us. You know, I just think that the fear of like just Putting loving somebody here, just yeah. you know, like. I don't have to say that, you know, the fact that there's different meanings of love. There's different loves, of course, but it's just like, it's okay to love other human beings, man. The world deserves it. The world needs it. Yeah. There's so much shit going on. It's just like, I feel like there are a lot more people waking up now in terms of what the actual reality is, but also what the world actually can be and what it yeah. can look like. But man. I feel like it's like getting better and worse at the same time. Yeah, but also the, the worst, well... <clears throat> Because that other part is being forced and shoved into our faces. Yeah. Purposely though. It's hap it's it's just like it's purposeful. Like it, it has an intent and the intent isn't good. Yeah. But if you can see what that intent is, like it'll be easier to to kind of filter through it. Mm -hmm. You know, because mm -hmm. if they're not being truthful, you'll know. Yeah. And that, but I think that it's getting be filtered. I, I do think the that's the benefit of the one the one good thing about all this social media and internet and all that stuff is like it's a lot harder to the truth is a lot easier to find yeah you know and you can connect with like-minded people and you can do all this stuff and For i don't sure. know it used to be so much Shout easier to, to sort of lie to people yeah all those like every page that i follow on instagram is an intent behind it yeah and there's real knowledge to acquire that like things that you think just happen by accident or yeah. by chance there there's an explanation behind it so um I'm on that track, but more or less, I'm I'm happy that I finally accepted what, um, you know, whoever that higher power is, just that he gave that energy to me to give to the world, because I think that it needs to be said, it needs to be heard, man. Yeah. Like, oh. so you gotta send me like whatever documentaries or books and stuff. You're into, <laughs> no, for sure, you know? for sure, bro. It, it's like my, it's almost I can say it's mind blowing because you start figuring. Yeah, but out you can more just damn it, you can just get sucked into that stuff for so long yeah but like an injury and a couple of docs and like you could just be on a whole another thing you know what i mean yeah that, that injury, but i needed some painkillers and like, I, I, knew, <laughs> like I, needed oh, to, I needed that man that was yeah. a wake-up call man yeah that was no, a wake-up call it. for sure um okay last thing mm -hmm. you i always say this um you can go back and talk to to young Kyrie, and i always try to pick a moment of like exactly which version of Kyrie that is and i'm gonna say the when you're loading up all your trophies 
into uh, a trash bag and smashing them and taking them out to the dumpster. And now everything that you've been through and seen and you know witnessed and learned, if you could go back and just yeah. tell that that little Kyrie yeah. one thing to make life a little easier, Look, what would you say? I would tell him. I would tell myself. I'll be looking at it. And I'll be and I do and I do it just like how I talk to my daughter now. <laughs> but I don't talk to my like when my because <laughs> when my daughter's doing something, she knows she's not supposed to be doing. It. I'm like, uh -huh. what are you like? What are you doing? And she looks at me. And that's how you get her attention, and that's when you put in the lesson that you want to teach her, and then or teach her, and then she goes about it like, take your time on the steps, and she's like, she doesn't say anything. I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> she looks up at me. I'm like, we take our time and we concentrate. When we walk down the stairs. She's like, okay, and then she's walking down the stairs. She's grabbing the rail. I'm like, we take our time and we concentrate. So uh -huh. if that's me, if I'm talking to myself back then, at that moment, I would. I would tap myself on the shoulder, even though I hate and knowing how much I hate being tapped on my shoulder. Mm -hmm. I'd be like, I know myself. I would turn around, and be like, like what? And then, I'm like, do you know what you're doing? And I would say it very calmly, and with the intent behind that I'm not a threat. I'm not a because I know myself. So I'm. You got to come off like you're not a threat. Yeah. That there is a great intent behind what you're going to tell me. The independence in which you're seeking right now, I appreciate the intent behind it. I know that at this present moment, it may feel like you're doing the right thing, but you're ultimately trying to hurt yourself so you can hurt your father or you can hurt the people that want you to keep doing this. Yeah. You know that you have a very, very deep love for basketball. It's often been questioned because of the pressure that your father puts on you, my father puts on me. And that's okay because you'll ultimately break out of this status that you're in right now. There's more life to experience and there's more idle time for you to have in order to have that understanding that if, if you, you really, really want, want something, something in this, this world, world, then there's, there's gonna, gonna be a amount of sacrifices that, that you're gonna, gonna need to make in order to reach wherever, wherever you wanna go. go. Yep. And, and that's, that's anything, anything. It's, it's not, not just, just basketball. basketball. You have a very unique ability to bridge the gap between everyone and bring that connection to everyone. And how do you do that? Yeah. And I would probably, I'd be like, I don't know. And then, you know, just be like, bro, it's Calm all down. right. <laughs> like this world is not as scary as people make it. Yeah, it's It's pretty awesome if you see it for what it is and you can, dissect the things that make sense and don't make sense to you and filter and filter and continue to continue to build who you are. You have a good armor on you right now, but just wait until you're older. You're gonna see yourself and you're gonna be just enamored that you can't even believe the amount of people that you've helped and impacted Yeah. just based off just being who you are. And damn, you're gonna get so many opportunities. I'm kind of jealous. <laughs> I'm kind of jealous about that. Yeah, go back. Yeah, and start I'm kind of jealous about that <laughs> yeah. because I really, I really wish I can relive some of those moments like that where it was just so life changing, and uh, you know, and then also don't be afraid to to reach out to people. Yep, and also bring the people that mean a lot to you a lot closer yep. because yep. they they need it and they want it. Yeah, so done. The bridge. I'm gonna start calling you the bridge. Does anyone call you the bridge? Nope. All right, the bridge. Uh, thank you, man. I really appreciate you doing this. Uh, sure. That was incredible. Appreciate you it. You killed it. Sure. Thank you, brother.